You had touched on this topic of advances in machine learning, artificial intelligence, and data analytics as a whole, sort of as this way of expediting material science research and you know, helping get these new materials out the door and into the space where they can be really useful. So there's certainly a lot of impact in our field, particularly as a means of predicting the performance of the properties of materials without spending those valuable resources and the money required on repeated testing and experiments to, to really verify that stuff, which is, which is really, really exciting. The specific sense, you know, how much impact do you envision the data analytics, the computational material science and engineering having in the fields in the future? And what would be your recommendation to material science and engineering students and professionals about the utility of taking a serious look at computational science as something in in their skill set. Yes, I think computations are going to be an important skill set for every material scientist engineer. You know, no matter you decide to go into an industry-based career or a research career, I th- I think it's just going to become a routine skill set that everybody is going to need to have. And and I will say that it's not a difficult thing. It's not something that should scare people. But I think when you look at the value of it, when it gives you the realization that rather than doing 10 experiments in the lab where I have to work day and night to prepare my material and do a test, and at the end of the day, I may or may not get a clear result. Something may happen in the test. When you do something, there are errors. And oftentimes, you know, it becomes challenging as to how do I separate the actual result from the error. Whether the error is related to the sample that I prepared or the machine misbehaving and giving an error because of the hydraulics did not work properly, because of the oil or the pressure gauge did not give you the correct effect. So testing is time consuming. It's an iterative process and there are always errors associated with that. Computational models are not free from uh, those things either. Computations rely on actual models and models need to be validated with data. So right. if you don't have the data, then you know, oftentimes people use this phrase, you know, garbage in, garbage out. <laughs> <laughs> so having an understanding of uh, what you are putting to in the computational program, how you're using it and what you're expecting it to give you And then how are you going to utilize that information? I think all of those uh, aspects are necessary. Now, it it turns out this realization of the importance of computations, we have known this for more than 20, 30 years. But because of these limitations, again, I think today we are at that stage that our measurements are becoming more and more reliable, which means that we can use these computational models more reliably, have better validation. Our understanding of the science is improving. The computational power is increasing. The speed at which you can run these calculations, my God, it's uh, it's phenomenal. So think about the process of rolling, you know, or melting or additive manufacturing, any of these processes. Imagine if you had a feedback loop where you are, as the process is happening, you're measuring the structure, you're monitoring the structure, but you're also measuring the properties in real time. And all of that data is fed into the computer, which is then responding by tweaking the knobs of the processing system. You know, so if something is happening too fast, or too slow, or the temperature in a certain area, maybe for whatever reason exceeded a certain limit, it will bring it down to where it is needed. So if you can do this in some kind of a high throughput manner, that's the holy grail. I think that's where we are going. And it's not just in terms of making the material, but now apply it to the usage of the material. Now, you know, you, you think about bridges. People use all kinds of sensors that are placed on the bridge. So every time you're driving across the bridge, the sensor is monitoring. Now imagine that same sensor actually placed on the metal itself, or, or imagine it in a different way. You're not embedding, you're not you know, gluing or strapping a sensor, but the material itself has a built-in sensor, meaning mm-hmm. the atoms themselves are configured in a way that they're able to sense the changes that are happening in that metal. Well, nature does it, right? Nature right. does. It. I mean, how do living species know 
that is getting cold? You know, how do the birds know the direction they need to fly? Right. The response to stimuli is the, you know, you know programming our materials to respond in the same way. Is- exactly. Whether it's the wings, the feathers, the fibers in the feather or the, the fibers that are the hair on the skin, all of those are sensors. And those sensors are what sense the stimuli, the temperature, the air pressure or whatever it is, and then send a signal to the brain and the brain then responds and says, okay, go in this direction. Yeah, so, that's so yeah, cool. can we can we build materials? I think that is the challenge. Right? Can we create materials? And I think to do that, you need this integration of computational power, the ability to do the measurements. Because again, you know, imagine, okay, you have a sensor or mounted on a metal, it will give you some signal, but you need to understand what the signal means. Right. To understand right. the signal, you need the computational capability. It reminds me of smart materials too. That's so cool how it responds to stimuli and can change on its own without any external acting upon it to make those changes. So that's super cool. Yeah. yeah. And metals have that ability, right? I mean, you talk about smart metals, smart alloys. I mean, there's this class of the shape memory alloys. Night right? and Which is an alloy of nickel and titanium. So nitinol is considered a smart material, but it's not smart in the sense that it has a brain or anything like that. Just its ability to go through changes in structure based on the stimuli that it sees. I was just actually writing a paper about nitinol and it's really cool how it has that shape memory property and super elasticity. So you can bend it, you can stretch it and it'll retain that shape. But then the second you put it under a critical temperature, it'll actually remember its original form and return to that form too. So super cool how these materials work. 